Good morning, everybody. Um, I thought I'll give my thoughts on the Nations League after watching a little bit, <laughs> a little bit, a lot. Over the past six days, you saw my daily recaps on Nations League play. And yeah, uh, for me, it's still a little bit national teams. There is something special about it. I love club soccer. It's it's the better product, but having national teams play there is I don't know. There's something to it. Again, I always have the feeling that national teams watching them there's a lot more color in there. Also, that the jerseys are not uh, with sponsors is a big plus to me. So yeah, that's why I love national teams. I'm also wearing national team jersey, Portugal. 2016 final, 2016-17 uh, version. Uh, we'll look at that probably in a, a close in another video. Uh, was kind of got it last year uh, and was kind of flabbergasted that I could get it on the deal. But more on that when I do a video about that jersey. And yeah, let's talk about Nations League. I think overall I like. The idea of the Nations League, uh, especially, especially, especially since um, it gets rid of a lot of friendlies that are always tedious to watch. Uh, but there is also a little downside that you know now would be the Euro qualifiers kicking off. Um, so the September window, it was a little bit of a mixed bag because usually in the September you get your first, at least your first game in Euro qualifying. And I think when you see the Nations League and the many friendlies also around it, that was maybe a little bit of a setback. Um, if I talk about Austria, you did not start out with a competitive game, no, you started out with a friendly against Sweden, which is a decent opponent, uh, although Sweden was not playing with the first team squad as well. So, um, yeah, and friendlies to me, uh, I think they are somewhat dish or right to watch on TV, but if I go to a stadium and I watch a friendly, um, especially now that I'm a little bit more in tune with soccer, I mean, when I was young, I remember. Austria played Portugal in Linz here and it was a big deal and you know all the Portuguese stars yeah. they were not the huge team that they are now but they were every, everyone said that they are a very talented side I think it was in 92 I guess 92 Austria Portugal Paulo Futre was the big star back then for Portugal I, I, I remember that and I remember I won one draw that was the one time I saw Ernst Happel. But back then, you know, it was a big deal and uh, people took friendlies a lot more serious than they became now. I think as soon as the Champions League got blown up, uh, friendly games became more tedious to watch. Um, because before that, even in a friendly, you would not see the many uh, changes. Or if you would see them, it would be rather late. Nowadays, I always have the feeling that they are exchanging the entire squad and it breaks the play. And usually you only play with your first team squad in the first half. And then that's that. Bring uh, in the other players to see how they are doing. I understand it from a coach's perspective, but you also got to understand that most of the uh, games kind of end on a dull note because A, the players don't put in full effort anyway, and B, once the uh, play breaks up uh, with all the substitutions, it's not interesting anymore. So for that reason, I think the Nations League is great. However, I also got the feeling, and again, we come back to Portugal. It's not the reason why I'm wearing this shirt, by the way, but it so happens that, for instance, Ronaldo says he wants to focus on Juventus, so please don't call me up for the squad, uh, which in itself is okay, but it kind of already devalues the Nations League a little bit, and it bugs me because I already railed against uh, FIFA for uh, weighting the Nations League games not as highly in their new rating system. 
but yeah, I guess um, it reflects how many teams approach it. I also saw it when I saw France playing against Germany and uh, many players complaining that they're tired already, you know, this was not the this was not entirely the frost squad that we've been seeing. Uh, it's not that they were that exciting at the World Cup, but you could see a lot of discipline at the World Cup. Um, didn't see that necessarily. And yeah, they started playing and getting exciting uh, when they needed against the Dutch, but not before that. So yeah, that was kind of sad to see. Uh, and I think many other games as well. Um, you know, you could see Spain was taking it super serious, and but they had a good reason to do so because they had this, this the disappointing World Cup. So I totally get that. Uh, England was also take, take, taken serious, but I think uh, Portugal, France, you know, there were teams that were not taken, and then even going lower. Uh, I, I would even say Germany didn't use it more as a rebuilding exercise uh, than anything else uh, and I also gotta add the Austria to it because the squad that was the lineup that was used against Bosnia now that I think about it was not uh, the first team lineup I think I mean there were two or three changes that you didn't see in the friendless before that that's a surprise, honestly, and I don't know, it could have been for technical considerations, but I honestly think it also reflects a little bit that uh, coaches are more willing to experiment uh, in this setup. And probably it is not that, I don't know, of course in League A you get all the big name opponents if you're lucky. I mean. I'm not sure if I would consider, for instance, the group Belgium, Switzerland, Iceland as all big name opponents, although they are strong teams. But the chance that you play big name opponents is, of course, higher. But if I look around in uh, League C, there are quite a few teams that could well play in League B, and vice versa. So, you know, it's kind of, a, I think, the difference between those two leagues is maybe smaller. A lot smaller than one would think. Serbia is one example, although they also didn't quite, were well, not quite that convincing in their results. So yeah, that was the one downside, but the upside is of course that you got some really good games and uh, I already mentioned Spain really used it to demonstrate that at the World Cup this was not the Spain side that we should have seen with this, am this amount of talent that we all knew that and I said it if you watch my very first video since I kind of restarted this channel my very first video was that Spain uh, shot itself in the foot by firing Lopetegui I still maintain I said it back then that Spain probably will make it out of the group and then uh, I even thought that they might make it to the quarters, but uh, this was a team that was destined for way more than that. Um, I know in the Spanish newspapers are now kind of bemoaning, yeah, this was a surefire final. Probably. I think Spain playing the way they played. I think Croatia was a much better team at the World Cup. So I don't think they would have, if there was a meeting between Spain and Croatia, it would have been a much tighter one. But yeah, uh, it's not inconceivable that France would have played Spain in the final. Entirely not. Entirely impossible. Talent wise, yes, that could have been one possible final. Uh, but you know, saying that Spain could, could, could have won, should have won it or would have won it if they had uh, still the normal coach, I think is a little bit. It's also classic Spain, I have to say. Spain dazzles in qualification, dazzles in friendlies, and very often, even the great squads, when it counts, uh, it's a much tougher going. Recall the 2010 World Cup. Spain, ahead of this World Cup, was dominating everything. They had just this one slip up in the Confederations Cup against the US, which, yeah, you don't. I, 
no one really paid too much attention to. They were just dazzling. I remember, I think they killed off Poland in a pre-tournament friendly 6 nothing or something like that. And then they get to the World Cup and suddenly they lose one nothing against Switzerland. And it was really, really tough. Only once they beat Paraguay in the quarters, you could see that there was some relief that they finally had achieved something historic. And from that moment on, against Germany, the squad seemed freed. The Netherlands kind of made it a mess in the final. But you could see that at that point, Spain really finally felt confident in themselves again. And this is a Spanish trade that I think they never were really able to shake off. And once Spain gets going, they're ruthless. Um, Austria, 9 nothing, losing to Spain. Uh, it's a typical Spain performance. Spain does not let up. Once they, go, once they get, get going, they get going. Ask Argentina, 6-1. I mean, uh, the, this, year's, this year's results of Spain were take a World Cup out were mind blowing. But I think I, I would think that if Lopetegui was still the Spain coach at the World Cup for the entire tournament, uh, at least the semi final was a real possibility. This is was a, was and is a super talented Spain squad. But back to the Nations League. So um, I think most of it was good to watch. I think there were quite some exciting games. Um, it was not World Cup level most of the time, but that's also not too surprising. The one real downside is, but also a little bit expected if you saw, especially League C and League D games, there were many empty stadiums. I'm not talking about the ones where uh, with a band spectators. I'm talking regular games. Uh, that Finland doesn't sell out against Hungary, yeah, Finland rarely sells out games, I would say. Uh, but that is kind of a little bit of a downside. Of course, the Ferry Islands had a full house against, I think, a bit Malta, and that was great to see. Um, but, you know, I always wish that now this is take the nations, especially for the smaller nations, to maybe not play in the biggest stadiums in your country. Uh, you can take it elsewhere. I think Austria is making the same mistake. They're taking now the two, um, the two um, Nations League home games against Bosnia and Northern Ireland. They're gonna play it in the Ernst Happel Stadium, which is the biggest stadium in Austria. But they're not gonna fill that one even close. If they would play in a smaller city. Uh, I'm absolutely certain that they would um, sell out the game there and have a good um, support there. Uh, and I think many teams should go for that. Uh, don't, going back to Serbia, don't play in Belgrade. Play in uh, Novi Sad, play in Niš, somewhere, you know, somewhere outside of the regular. I think uh, Bosnia does it. They play their home games in Seneca. Uh, which is an hour away from Sarajevo, but I think that's a pretty uh, sweet deal because you really can um, get spectators there. Uh, I also saw the Bulgarian national team was playing in Sofia, um, the big stadium. They are not even close to filling that one. Yes, it was the game against the game against Norway was already pr uh, probably the biggest opponent, but who in who is interested? in Norway if you're from Bulgaria. Of course, if this was in Denmark or Sweden, that will, Iceland, this would be a different story. So I think this is what federations do wrong. Uh, if you have um, not so high level opponents, go to smaller cities. They would be happy to finally see the national team. Uh, I know this personally. Uh, you know, Linz is at the moment Entirely different story. We have a stadium that is of decent size, but it's 500 people. Uh, the capacity is 500 too little uh, to host a national team unless you have to pay a fine. They, held, they hosted that. They revamped the stadium and didn't take care of that. And when they had the one home game in the last 10 years uh, against the Ivory Coast, they got the national team. Of course, they had to pay a fine because they couldn't. Uh, it was uh, 
filled to capacity, but it was too little. So yeah, that's that's great planning. But Linz is full with shit like that. Uh, so yeah, I think this is one one way to resolve this. I think Ukraine by going to Lviv uh, did something like that because. Um, you don't feel the same against Slovakia. Of course, they had the ban, so it didn't really matter. I think the other thing, of course, with Ukraine is that uh, you cannot really play in Eastern Ukraine at the moment. So you take the most modern stadium uh, that you have outside of Kiev, which is a third Lviv, and go with them. So that was one big thought that I had that I think many get wrong. Go into smaller stadiums for the group stage of Nations League play. I understand Germany against France, you played it in a big stadium, but uh, look at your opponents and then decide, okay, we're gonna play this in a smaller town. Entirely reasonable, I think. Other than that, I like that there's something going. Uh, the other thing that I, uh, that there is, you know, there's a competition going and that, you know, especially in the groups of three, I think there's something at stake for everyone in every game um, because the top one goes up, the bottom one goes down, so there's a lot of interchange which surely makes it interesting, but I was wondering if that isn't a little bit too radically. I would think that you should make a playoff for the last place teams and only two go down and uh, two go up, something like that, or make, you could make a relegation play, a match up one from B with one from C, right at the time when you have the final four. I understand that this may be, um, conf this would conflict of course with the uh, qualifying uh, schedule. So now we have a lot of glare again, yeah, a little bit better. Oh, yes. But yeah, I think this might be a better way to go about it. I also think you could do it because if you have the groups of three especially, so at least between A and B, just a thought. The, the other thing is that in these cases you... I did not like that some teams already played twice and some teams only played once and the ones that played once... Uh, you, cannot, you cannot really say that, but you know, there's something a little bit missing. I, I, now, when I look at the, at the Austria group, for instance, you have Bosnia with six points uh, ahead, beating the other two opponents. And same thing goes for Spain. So, uh, if anyone wanted to have a chance, Bosnia looks very comfy. I think um, you take your... You, you won against your strongest opponent, presumably in Austria at home. Uh, not this on Northern Ireland, uh, just looking at the world rankings. I don't think that Austria will do well against Northern Ireland, just for the record. Uh, I know the history, I know what we can do, so I really don't expect anything against Northern Ireland. But I'm just saying, let's assume that Austria is... Even if, let's say, Austria's the strongest team and they lost to uh, Bosnia. Uh, what Bosnia just needs to go for a draw now in their game against Austria and hope that they get another draw, at least a draw from Northern Ireland. I think they're more or less through. Um, so, the same for Spain. I mean, Spain looks completely in control of that group. They can even afford a loss to either England or uh, Croatia. Another win takes them through. I'm absolutely certain of that. So that's a little bit of a downside. Uh, the other thing is, of course, if you have the double like Iceland, <laughs> you're basically out uh, with two games and the other two play for it. But I think that's a little bit uh, the more interesting way of looking at those Nations League groups. But yeah, that, that for me was one downside, I think that the groups of three are not ideal. I think I like groups of four better because you keep the, you can keep the suspense a little bit longer. And especially if you schedule smartly, I think the the two groups in League C that I, well, actually almost all of them, they are all still very open, the uh, three groups of uh, four teams. I think they're all pretty, pretty open and interesting still. Uh, and 
I cannot say this for some League A and League B uh, groups. Simply cannot. So there you go. Uh, it also creates a little bit this imbalance that you know um, groups of three are just not ideal. I think in Nations League play this is all right because uh, it's not a really do or die like at the World Cup where you just cannot have it. But we will have groups of three again. Thank you FIFA for that. It just doesn't work. Uh, you need to. I think you need to have groups of four in order to get something reasonable out of a competition. Um, groups of three is just some abnormality. That history will show again. Just does not work. Just does not work. I maintain that. Uh, at least here we have home and away series in the group, so that's cool. But yeah, I think I was more excited about the Nations League prior to watching, but I still am very much on the positive uh, on it. As I said, I rather, as a soccer fan, football fan, I call it soccer these days, and uh, it's not because I was in America, because it's a proper term. It's a proper term that comes actually from Great Britain, not from America. But yeah, I still very much in favor of having it. But I think there's room for improvement, of course. Uh, but you know, for a first go around, I think it is nice. As I said, um, maybe in League B, already League A, League you should probably make groups of four. That's all. That's all I'm wanting. Okay, let me know what you think about the Nations League. Uh, whether you like it, uh, you see improvements, uh, whether you agree with me that not all teams did take it all that seriously yet, which is a little bit of a shame. I think it needs to develop into something bigger. But I think they should. we should at least uh, give UEFA two or three additions before we uh, call the entire thing off. Uh, I always warn against it because very often uh, there are quick decisions. No, this doesn't work. In this case, I think it will stay around for a while. I just hope that FIFA does not go for a, a worldwide Nations League because I think that would be an entire mess. I, I really feel that uh, strongly about that. Yep, yeah. other than that, I think I'm still excited about it. I just wish there was. I could be a little bit more excited. I think when there is a qualification campaign, they, I always have to feel there's a little bit more excitement than I felt now with this Nations League personal perception. Let me know what you think about that, about the Nations League in general, um, what more modifications you would make. Give me a thumbs up if you like this video and uh, subscribe to this channel if you want to see more videos like this. I'm arriving at work now. And I will talk to you soon. Bye. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe to my channel. If you've already done so, I would like to thank you for your support. It is very much appreciated. Also, check out the accompanying blog at the link provided in the description below and at the end of this video. Thank you for watching and until next time.